Hello everyone, I am Alex from Board Game Co. And today with me, I have <laughs> Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple. Hi Luke, how's it going today? Hey, not bad at all, thanks. Yes, and for those who don't know, first of all, if you... I mean, what we're doing here today is officially called 10 Seconds Reviews, although if I copy what Luke did, which I probably will, it's <laughs> going to be a 10 Seconds sort of-ish reviews. And this is part two, actually. Part one already was all over on his channel. I'll include a link that, to that down below, so make sure you head over there to check that out. But basically, this is us going back and forth, asking for, you know, quick, you know, to the point, 10 second-ish reviews of a game, where in this case, I'll be asking Luke for his reviews. And then from there... The many or some of them will turn into different conversations and I'm sure some of them will you know either not have been played or whatever it is basically the way I look at it is if a conversation develops I'm counting it uh, if no conversation develops we'll skip it and move to the next one and between all of these the goal is to get roughly 30 of these but we'll we'll see how that plays out so Luke if you're ready we're gonna start you off with trains trains uh, <laughs> essentially a copycat of Dominion with a map that kind of makes the game worse than Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't disagree. I think it's a very valid assessment. I was enamored with Trains when I first got it. When I first played it, I was enamored. I thought, this is cool. This is interesting. Uh, but Dominion's still in my collection, and Trains is not. And so I think overall, I would agree with your assessment. Yeah, they, some friends of mine are big fans of Trains, but they like train games in general, and I can't stand Trains as a physical concept, <laughs> apart from Ticket to Ride, ironically. But the... The problem with it is that I love Dominion as the deck builder. And granted, Trains is a deck builder, a pure deck builder. Yep. But that map just puts me off because most of the time it's random as to what you can do on it because you have to play the right cards to to do it. It's just a hexagonal, boring as anything map with a tiny little cube you put in the middle to represent a track. It doesn't even look like tracks. Yeah. You know, how could you yeah. how could you mess up that? <laughs> you know, I never thought about that, but I agree <laughs> with you. I agree with you that the even if they had just give you new train pieces, it would have already been a better uh visual experience if nothing else. But yeah, I agree overall. I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, I, I like the concept. I like the deck building. I, I just felt the board implementation was not as developed as I would like. The good news is on this list today, we have at least two other deck builders with a board. So we'll see how those play out. But that will be trains. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Next is up, and this I'm gonna probably going to butcher the name. I believe it's pronounced Yentes, I think. But it's the one that's called Gentes or Gentes, but I believe it's... Oh, yeah. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. Maybe you know. I don't actually know. Uh, I don't know its proper pronunciation. I get the feeling it's Gentes. Oh, could be. I, I wouldn't can, know. Could be this is by TMG. That. This is a not a deck build. This is a war, reverse worker placement game. But I'll let you do the review. Ooh, I got to think because it's been a while since I played it. Uh, uh, well, pro well produced worker placement Euro with a few neat twists on the typical genre, but gets very samey after a few plays. Interesting. That is very interesting. How many times have you played this, Luke? Uh, probably about four total. Four. Uh, so not. I didn't do a full review of this one. This is mainly my friends had it and they eventually sold their copy, but I played it in that time. So the reason I asked is because your review is interesting to me because I've only played this one twice myself, and I find it very unique, very interesting, and currently am enamored with it. I'm currently intrigued by what it's doing. But you basically said multiple plays may be the issue, which is something I've definitely seen in other games where I loved it at first and then over time is like, oh, it's it's just not variable enough. And so now now I'm interested to see how my uh, fifth, sixth, seventh play, if I get that far, of this game develops. I'm trying to remember a lot of it because it was quite a while ago since I played it. But I mean, I mean, I liked how it looked. I thought how yeah. it looked and was produced was quite cool. And as much as it's basically just glorified tracks, I thought the way the use different people as a resource, mm -hmm. I thought yep. that was quite cool. Uh, but apart from that, you tenderly had seen that kind of stuff in other Euros. Like, oh, here's my tableau of cards. They do various bits and bobs. But after I played it a fair few times, I felt like I was doing a sim similar tactics to win each time. You know, you need those cards and that's kind of the focal point. Um, the different people that you can use didn't feel that differentiated to me and there was the the map aspect where you could build certain buildings and that yeah and i i think if i recall correctly there was two different types you could do one got you money or something like that like an income source yes. and the other one was um unlocked certain things i couldn't remember what it was uh, so or... the money was money i believe i'm trying to remember what the other one was myself as well now i want to pull up some like images here and find it but uh yeah i agree with you the first one was money 
And then the second one was like locations, placements, or something like that. Yeah, like, and I oh found no, that cubes. When I was... Yeah, placing cubes on those boards on the top board. Yeah, and I found that one of those types of buildings was worth building, and the other one just didn't feel like worth it because I mean it, it was quite expensive to build a lot of those. Yeah, and trying to focus on it just didn't seem to work for me. Now that might have just been because I was playing it wrong or bad, but yeah, you know, I, I think I, I mean. After I'd played it about four times or so, I just, you know, when it came up as a potential to play, I thought, yeah, that was okay, but why doesn't it want to grab me back? And I think mainly because it probably isn't that unique a Euro game when you drill down into it. It was just the fact that it looked very different to it, like visually I, different. Yeah, I agree to an extent. Like, the to begin with, the reverse worker placement is, practically speaking, no different than just worker placement. It's it's, it's a different name and a different way it's done, but ultimately it is the mm. same thing. And for those who don't know, the work of reverse worker placement is the idea that you're pulling the these tokens off the board rather than putting your workers down onto the board. But the, the end result is the same. Uh, but the part that I particularly enjoyed about it is the combination of the card play and then the fact that your workers on those tracks, you had to push them in different directions to get different abilities, and they capped out. So you could have a 6 and 1, or you could have a 4 and 3. I mean, you have that balance of, of hitting till 7, which I enjoyed the push and pull of trying to figure out, do I want more access to cards? Do I want more access to workers? Where do I want to uh, push my competitive advantages, and how do I combine that with the card play? But again, all that said, that is something that may well be the same puzzle every single time. I, I feel I need to revisit now once I get my fourth play in and see how, where it stands for me. But cool. That would be Gentis. Two for two so far. We're doing well. Let's see if we're three for three. Coming up is Merchants and Marauders. This one's going to be a lot shorter because I've only played it once. Uh, yeah, you're talking about that piratey... Yes, I am. ...comic game. If it helps, I haven't played it in like six years. I mean, it's probably a good three, four years since I played it to try to sum it up. I mean, uh, I just remember... I can't remember what genre it was. Was it an economic game or was it uh, a... It's a sandboxy game. So let's do a quick yeah. overview and then you can go into the review. The overview of Merchant Riders would be it's a sandboxy style game where you can play more as a merchant, more as a pirate. Both paths are viable. You're it. trying yeah. to manage the economy of pick up and deliver to a certain extent of different resources at locations while also plundering ships to get what you want from there. Uh, the goal of the game is ultimately to get to 10 points, which you can get up to 5 points through money. Every 10, 10 money is a point. And then you can get points through a variety of other things throughout the game. Yeah. I mean, from what I can recall, you know, it was a meaty sandbox pirate thematic game that had a lot of potential, but was quite difficult to get to the table often, whether because of length, scope, or rules. Yes, exactly, yeah, it, yes. <laughs> it, a friend of mine has a lot of these games, a specific friend. He's got things like Twilight Imperium. Uh, oh, there was a... Archipelago, oh. Merchants and Marauders, you know, these like fairly big epic scale games, yeah. Desire and stuff like that. And it's great when I played stuff like that with him, but it's rare once in a blue moon we'll ever play them. But when we do play them, it's like, oh my God, there's a lot to think about with this one. <laughs> a lot of rules to consider. And I, I think that's the one thing I kind of remember off it. It's like, if it was a bit more streamlined, I probably would have really got into it, even though I'm not the biggest pirate fan. It's not my favorite theme from history ever but it yeah I just, I just remember it being quite complicated but still pretty enjoyable yeah i agree with everything you said uh, i love merchants Riders back in the day i played it a lot when i first got it and over time i realized it just wasn't hitting the table because of the complexity of the teach and it wasn't actually complicated but there were a lot of small rules in addition to the main core rules uh, and then just the length of play uh, and overall it's one that i would never turn it down if i was at someone's house and they wanted to play it, i'd be like oh my gosh i love that game it's great let's play it but like you said you got I, the evening off yeah yeah exactly exactly <laughs> i i don't feel i, I mean I think my last play of it that clinched me for getting rid of it was a four-player game that took around five and a half hours. And I was like, it's good. It's just it's just not five and a half hours good. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I completely agree. There's okay. not enough games that are. That's the thing. It's, you know, there are some games that people love, like the Twilight and Beards I mentioned on the last video we did. And the game may still be enjoyable, but you've got to really sell the game to make me want to play it for four yeah. to five hours. Because... Yeah, I could play a PC game solidly probably for four to five hours, and certainly if it's a Sid Meier Civ game, I probably have done that because the just one more turn yes. thing is real. It's too addictive. But, you know, even most shoot 'em ups I play, like Deep Rock Galactic and that, I'll play them. I play them often, but I don't sit on it for four hours straight. Eventually, I want to move on to something else. I'm very much a variety as a spice of life 
person with a lot of things. Yeah. So it's all well and good saying, oh, you know, Sentinels in the Multiverse are one of my favorite games. Would I play it for four hours straight? Probably not. <laughs> you know, I'd probably want to say, we've played this for a, a 92 hours. Next, you know, next game, please. Yeah, and I don't disagree. Uh, for the most part, there are exceptions of games that are long enough that I'll play them, but they, they have to be the exception for me. Anything put past three hours has to be that much better to, to even be a discussion. But yeah. So that brings us to 4 for 4, and this is the first of a few that I know you've played. Uh, most, of the li- most of the games on this list are games that I don't know whether you've experienced them or not. Some of them I've either seen yourself in the background or a scene that you've done a review on, even if I don't know what the review is. I think there's two on the list I actually know your opinion, but I still want to have a discussion. But this brings <laughs> us to number four, which is going to be Tang Garden. Ah. <laughs> See. Very pretty, very zen-like. Oh, I don't very pretty zen game with beautiful components which is only let down by the fact you need spectacles and opera glasses to play the game (laughs) (laughs) so that's interesting so so have you played carcassonne yeah i've still got on my shelf which do you prefer what which version of it oh uh, base carcassonne versus base tang garden oh uh as a game for enjoyment value tang garden Easily. I mean, nice. Carcassonne, Carcassonne is on my shelf, and I played it yesterday on Board Game Arena with some friends of mine that I've been trying to meet up with. Uh, and I still like Carcassonne, but really I want to play it with expansions to get most yeah. out of it. And I mainly have it just because it's one of those, oh, you've never played games before. It's yeah. Carcassonne. I keep gateway games for that purpose. Tang Garden, I, u- I nearly kept on the shelf. It was like, do I keep it or not? And I did eventually get rid of it, oh. but not because I disliked the game. I thought it was, I think I gave it an eight. It's a great game the problem i had with it was i mean there were a couple of rules that were a little hard to explain but the main problem was just the graphic design was a big letdown for people i was playing it with yeah you need because some of it you need to see very faded iconography on tiles or you need to look at those wall borders and see the tiny little circles on there to see what character relates to it but they're so small you're playing this on a big table with four people sat around it. If I'm looking at this and I think, hang on, where's that got? You've got to pretty much get down and start looking at it from a first person perspective to know what they're looking at, which is beautiful from an Instagram perspective, but, but it's not, not from a gameplay, not from a gameplay. And I, I, I think the title of the review I did mention like great game, but you need opera glasses. Cause I do feel like you need some kind of like thing there just to go, Oh, that's the, is that yellow or is that dark <laughs> yellow? I'm not sure. And it's just like, Oh, if they just nailed that graphic design, I'd still be holding on to it. Cool. And this one, by the way, I have no opinion on this one. I haven't actually played, by the way, which a handful of this list I have not played, and they're really just me taking advantage of the fact that I want to find out more about them and whether I should get them. Okay. Am, I just building, yeah, am I just building you a giant shopping list? <laughs> uh, so for some of these, a few. I, I would say there's definitely like six or seven of this list that are, are shopping lists for me. And speaking of shopping lists, uh, number five is going to be Western Legends. Hmm. On that... Uh... The quintessential sandbox game, if you're a fan of westerns, there is no other comparison. You use the word quintessential. That's a big testimonial. (laughs) That is nice. I'm I'm not even the biggest fan of the western theme. I mean, I don't mind it, but I, hand on heart, I've not watched a proper western. Like, I've seen clips. My dad has occasionally put one on TV if I'm home for Christmas, like, for 10 minutes. Um, but I would not be able to recognize John Wayne if you put him in front of me. As I, I'd literally, I, I don't watch westerns. I'm not a big I fan of the whole. I barely watch like, westerns, but John Wayne is John Wayne. I, I'd forget. I'd forget what he looks like, though. I mean, unless you, I mean, do, unless you're going to class um, the Alamo. Uh, Wild Wild West, Back to the Future 3, or Fifel Goes West as a Western. I None of those are westerns. westerns. <laughs> oh, come on, Back to the Future 3 has got a sort of count. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, it's in that setting, even though it's got time machines and stuff. But, um, but a proper something like Tombstone or a, a you know, or Tombstone's fight good. on the o- or fight on the OK Corral or whatever half of these uh, ones are called. I just haven't watched them because I think I I get a little bit bored with the whole thing of like you know yeehaw, fancy sharing one of your air partner and <laughs> revolver fights and stuff. It's it, it's fine. It's just not for me, but. Like I said, I've just never watched a Western all the way through. But this game is still 
great fun because i usually like westerns when you're taking the mick out of it slightly or when sure. it's a little bit satirical like i say back to the future free and wild wild west you know they're, they're in that setting but they are slightly parodying it a bit you know you get that out of this this game because everything about it is a giant sandbox am i going to rear cattle am i going to rob trains the bank's going to play poker go knock on other players the expansion adds even more stuff like go to the neighboring town actually properly rob a train as opposed to get on it go kill bandits uh you know be an outlaw be a marshal it's like you could literally decide what you want to do and i love i said variety is the spice of life i love that variety and how long does this one run what uh, each game yeah um you can do short medium or long and i don't recommend the short game i think it's too short but maybe if you're playing it with five players it might be worth doing a short game uh but i mean it can range anything from something like 90 minutes to two and a half hours that's not depending bad. on i'm just depending gauging... on the player counts so you so you're making me want to get this and this is one on my list to, be to to debate for a while i've had this on my list it's not just nothing here is just you know our ar 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 arbitrary yeah. the things that I'm am i going to be blamed by the wife yes for, like, 100%. your finances not even a question it depends how many we get <laughs> if we get one then you're fine okay excellent five for five so far and let's move on to number six which is going to be cry havoc Ugh, this will be a bit like the Merchants and Marauders one. Uh, this is a weird one. It didn't take off. I know. It's weird. And Tom Vassell loved it. I thought it would take off like mm. crazy. They went to a beef phase for like a month and a half where it was really popular. But it didn't really, uh, because of Tom Vassell's review. Mm. But then after that, I don't think it uh, really launched anywhere. Yeah, it played it way too long ago. Uh, you know... I think it was probably just like it was a cool concept with cool asymmet asymmetrical factions that was probably just a bit too fiddly to play and just didn't have the appeal. I don't know. It's it's hard to. No, you're good. You're on track. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We can move on from there. Great. Uh, so, <laughs> I, was, I mean, part of me wants to try the game again. So I'm right there it, with you. Like, but it just kind of bombed. Yeah, cry so I got it based on Time Vassal's review. Area Control is one of my favorite genres, and I played it, and I was like, it's it's cool in theory. I'm just, something about it is not pulling me in. I only gave it one play, to be very fair, uh, and I want to play it again almost because of that, but also I don't see anyone really going on about it except for Tom, so it's a hard one for me. Yeah, because it sort of went around. I mean, I think I've played it twice max. You had the factions, there was some talk about balance not being great, like one of the factions being the trolls or whatever they were being a bit too powerful, but Interesting. I, I didn't play it enough to notice. Uh, like the fact that each faction was different, although some factions were more enjoyable than others, you know, playing the people sort of coming in and shooting people up is a lot more yeah. interesting than the uh, mystical elvish ones or whatever they were the blue ones that basically just play a euro game for the whole time mm -hmm. it's like yeah i don't want to be that faction <laughs> but i don't i don't know what maybe people were put off by the combat system in it which i didn't mind i thought it was something different it it just kind of kind of came and went and now nobody really mentions it apart from one person on my top 10 portal games video who did actually come out and say why didn't you mention cry havoc <laughs> so. interesting this is a portal i didn't even was it portal it was portal oh nice good on i that. don't know I don't know if Ignacity designed it, but I know it was a portal game. Gotcha. It looks like he's not on the design list, but could have been developed. Don't know. Okay, moving on. Number seven. You're doing well so far, better than I was. Uh, number seven, <laughs> which I mean, I think they could be, that could either be your play more games than I do, or it could be I'm better at picking games. I'm going to go with the latter because that seems better. Um, a little bit of both, or I'm just riding the adrenaline from having recorded a podcast like five minutes before this started. So. Nice. <laughs> it's like the mind is currently firing up on all cylinders. So 7 of 30 is going to be a recent one. It's going to be Pan Am. Never played. Oh, okay. We'll move on there because I haven't either. That was on my shopping list. Number 8. Is, or... that, is, that, is that meant to be a kind of... I mean, the title sounds familiar. Is that it's, one of those so economic it's, airplane games? It's from Prospero Hall. It's a recent one. A publisher published by Funko Games. It's going to have a comparison to Ticket to Ride to a degree. Uh, but it's going to be more along... Like, almost a combination of Ticket to Ride and Airlines Europe in, in theme and implementation. But the actual gameplay, I don't know enough about to have a developed conversation on. Oh, this is a new one. 2020? Yeah. 2020, I said. It's a new one. Literally the same logo and everything. So I uh, picked this specifically because I knew you like Ticket to Ride, and I think that I've heard that if you like Ticket to Ride, this is a good one as well. On that description, I would try it. I mean, when I look at the games or Pan Am, and it says like Evergrown Pan Am, sell your routes to the company to earn a tidy profit. This makes me think 18xx in the sky, which is the worrying prospect. Because if it is like an 18xx game, I'm gonna have trouble with it. <laughs> but I don't think it's a full 18x. And keep in mind, it's from Prosper no. Hall, so it's going to be on the lighter side, comparatively speaking. It's not appealing to mm. a 
heavy, heavy audience, but rather a lighter entry, entry audience? I'd, I'd give it a try. Perhaps it's, I mean, looking at the board pictures, it's possibly giving me more of a Airlines Europe vibe, yes. maybe, yep. building up roots. And I do have Airlines Europe in the collection as a surprise hidden gem for me. So yeah, I'd give it a try, but I've just not, it says 2020. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I've seen a few things. I just figured uh, I try to sway away from some new ones unless I either knew that you've played it or uh, thought you may have played it like this one. Yeah, but wherever this is, I mean, I've not heard of it being released. Cool. Despite saying 2020, maybe it was a Kickstarter and it just hasn't fulfilled yet. But no, yeah. Prosper Hall's kind of Prosper Hall's titles generally fall a bit under the radar until they pick up that buzz. There's a whole bunch of them that show up. Uh, you know, Treasure, uh, Treasure something or other. I can't remember what it's called. Um, the Treasure Ride one from Disney or something. They have the Horrified, obviously. Uh, the Wonder Woman. They have all those titles that have been slowly infiltrating their way into the the general space. Oh, Horrified was theirs, was it? Yeah. Oh, well, I, would say I believe that. so. Okay. That got the buzz instantly. I haven't yep. heard of the others, though. Are they based in the U.S.? I don't know. I have no idea. Very, very curious. I wonder. I wonder if maybe they just don't get the the distribution, or so, so that they, you know, they're they're in a uh, they're based in Seattle, apparently, mm-hmm. Seattle, cool. Washington. But maybe they only distribute to like limited copies in the U.S. It doesn't get worldwide release, so I wouldn't have seen it oh, Essen or anything. Oh, that could be. Well, maybe. Maybe. I mean, that could be. I mean, Splatter Games have a limited distribution in that sense as well, so it could be related. But I don't know. Cool. anybody wants to shove Plan M in front of me, then I'll definitely try it. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll do to our next number seven is going to be Hanamakoji. <laughs> Ooh, yes. Oh, wait. Hands down, one of the best mini two-player card games I have played is frequently brought out at any event where I'm teaching games to couples. I like you more and more as this list goes on, Luke. Hannah Makoji is... People give me (laughs) shtick for hating on certain games. They don't realize I like a lot of games too. (laughs) Hannah Makoji is so elegant. It has replaced all of my other two-player games. Like, I have a lot, like Blitzkrieg, Battleline, uh, Watergate, Terra Nova, Tarji. I have a lot of two-player games. Hannah Makoji is one of my favorite. It's so elegant in the I pick, you choose distribution and the Mm. short playtime. It's beautiful. I pick you choose as a fun mechanic in general. It doesn't always work. I mean, like New York Slice and that, I didn't really get into yeah. much. But it's not so much that. It's just the fact that you've got four actions. That's it. Both of you will do them. But what order you do them has an impact. But then there's no set way to do it because it depends on the cards and what you're thinking. The earlier you do an action, the less you know, but the more choice you have. The later you do it, the more you know, but the less choice you have. It's just... I don't know how that got designed. It just sounds like such a system that no one would think of. But add the beautiful artwork. It's yep. what, like tw- 12 cards or something? It's like, uh, I think it's know, a bit more, but I mean, there's seven, seven. I can't remember. Is it seven five, each four, of the one? Maybe it's 15? Five, five, four, three, three, two, two, two. So, I mean, oh, oh, you're right. You're 20, right. 20 odd plus cards and some action tokens. And that's literally all it is. So but, most cards, pe- yeah. but most people have never heard of it. So when I... I've brought it to Dice Portsmouth um, events they used to do before they opened. They did like teaching things to say, look, we're going to open up this cafe. Here's who we are. I usually volunteered to say, look, I want this cafe to open. Do you want me to come and teach games? Always brought this one in the bag and always showed it as a two player game. No one would have heard of it, but they look at it and go, this is pretty. Show it to them. And within five minutes, their brains have melted because <laughs> they tried to come up with those decisions. And then they're playing game after game after game because it's, super quick i mean this one switched me on to emperor s4 as a publisher oh nice i think it was the first one i played from them and at that point i've now got five or six of their other games on the same shelf yeah and <laughs> for those keeping an eye out for this now that you've watched this and of course want it uh Jixia academy is going to be the reprinted yeah. version so both of those titles are effectively the same game yeah okay. i think i don't know if you can still get both but like i say they are the same they just changed the the setting yeah that's pretty much it Okay, so number eight is going to be Edge of Darkness. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's that lovely big box down there. <laughs> you own it. You own it. It's that good, at least. I also own it. I've reviewed it in all sorts. Uh, madness. Um, I think, uh, this is a weird one, this. <laughs> I'll try to describe that one in 10 seconds, but. One of the most innovative combinations of mechanics I've ever seen in a heavy Euro game, but is definitely for a niche market. <laughs> Interesting. It, okay. is, it is one of my favorite games I've got, and it is really cool, but it is 
a bit of a beast in terms of its uh, size and girth. Yeah. But the it's one of the most innovative combinations of games I've seen, and it just sort of hooked me in. Yeah, Edge of Darkness is one that I, this is one I haven't played myself yet. I am interested in it because I played Dead Reckoning, and this is going to be the same designer, John D. Clear, yeah. uh, from AEG. Both of them having that card crafting system. Uh, for myself, I've heard mixed things. I mean, it's rated pretty high. I think it's like a seven point seven on Board Game Geek, but it's it's despite that high rating, I still heard mixes of you know fiddliness or a little bit too much effort to get to the table for what it's worth. Mm-hmm. And then I've heard things like what you're saying about the praise for the game. It's it's one of those things that I mean, their views are valid. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to overlook a little bit of that. And I, one advantage, sorry, is that it does have a decent solo mode. So I can play it solo and enjoy it like that. But it's definitely a pricey game because it was an AEG Kickstarter. It is big. It's like a not as big as, but not, not much different, like Gloomhaven size crate um, for the stuff. And it's certainly overproduced to a slight extent because you've got essentially a cube tower, which is a cube castle, practically, yeah. <laughs> the free tier thing that obviously takes up a lot of table presence. And obviously it's definitely for gamers because you've got to deal with card crafting and the worker placement action selection type things. So there's quite a bit going on. But if you're into that stuff, it's just so enjoyable when you do play it. And pretty much I've only played this solo or with two friends of mine. Yeah, They are... It's it's like I say, it's a niche market. You know, it it will have a good rating on BGG, but it will probably be only so many people who have rated it gotcha. because it wasn't it wasn't distributed in retail. It was only Kickstarter. Yep. And that um, good solo mode is a good thing to note because I, whenever I have games like this, sometimes a good solo mode is enough for me to be more willing to get it, try it, and see whether it'll stick around or get to the table. Yeah, it's a variable old Tom there that does a reasonable job at simulating a human player to an extent. You know what. Yeah, but you're still getting the whole thing of here's my 10 locations, different every game. Here's all the cards that come out. I'm creating the card. It is that card crafty thing. And as I say, niche market, but it just put me in because I was already a fan of Mystic Veil, vale, which is on the shelf above it. Nice. And I never, I, I backed off the Kickstarter for Dead Reckoning. <sighs> I can't remember why. I think there was some drama around it. I, I, I plan on picking it yeah. up, but I didn't get the Kickstarter either. Yeah, you did a thing on it, and I think there yeah. was some drama about the value of it. I thought, like, yeah, I think it was a bit like the Freedom 5 escapade. It was kind of yes, like, oh, it was, they kept pushing it up. Yeah. But it got ridiculous, and I thought, I can't afford this, and especially when it was for a pirate theme game, which is not the first theme I jump on. But part of me regrets it, but then part of me is like, yeah, that was a lot of money. But There's time, there's su- time. One will, one will show its way up in your doorstep eventually. I'd be surprised if I didn't like it, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> okay, number nine is going to be the second of the deck building with a board. It's going to be Tyrants of the Underdark. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, as soon as you said there's two more of those, I thought, that's one of them. I'm oh, nice. The, okay. I'm curious what the other one is. <laughs> like, trying to think off the top of my head which ones they are. The other uh, one is... Well, well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it, yeah. Don't spoil. Uh, Tyrants of the Underdark... Uh, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> as a, as I say, as a hybrid area control deck builder, it's fine. It just lacks any unique selling point or theme to make me recommend it over other alternatives. Interesting. Nice. It's, I take it you don't own it anymore. It's. I never owned it before. I just played it a few times. But uh, I mean. Some friends of mine had it, and I played it at conventions and that, and it's like, the game is fine. I don't think it's bad at all, but I knew going in, it was going to have no theme whatsoever. It's like, just because you use the names mm-hmm. like of whatever the Underdark Drow Elves are, and that yeah. does not make it thematic. And it plays... The problem I had with it is that it just sort of played like every other deck builder with a area control board. Like, it was giving me a kind of trains vibe, just Okay, I probably prefer tyrants to trains. I would probably say, but uh, the I think it was just the fact that I I thought I played it and thought fine, above average, but where's its USP? What what is it about this particular one that makes me say, well, well, I don't want to play these deck builders. I want to play this one. And area control is not a mechanic I. Um, it's not it's not one I don't I dislike, but. Area control by itself is not enough for me to go, oh, I want to get this game. It's like it's it's a means to an end, but unlike something like multi-use cards, worker placement, or 
or deck building, I guess, in general, it's not a mechanic. I go, ooh, because <laughs> it's pretty easy to do area control. It's like, <laughs> there are spots on the board, you need majority to control it. Well, that's area control for you. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, well, I'm still intrigued, but not completely sold. This is one that I don't, I haven't played, by the way. This is the, uh, the area control and deck building has this on my radar, um, but I'm, 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 I'm still torn, which means not yet out of the shopping list, which brings us to our number 10, which is going well, we'll to be my city. We'll oh, sorry, compare it to the other one later on, once yes. we get to that one. So. Oh, the, the other one I, I already own, but we'll see. But so anyway, so uh, my city is number 10. My city. That's going to be the new uh, by Rhino Knizia. I'm taking you haven't played. It's the Legacy Polyomino game. No, I have not played. Uh, um, I know Joe and Son of a Board Game Ramblings have talked yes. about that one highly. It's like one of their favorites. And I just never got a chance to play it really because during COVID times, I think when it was kind of being more released, I didn't have the means to play it with a lot of people. And because I knew it was a campaign ish legacy game, yeah. uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be one that I can't because I don't think you can play it solo either. Um, I haven't looked into it. It doesn't seem... Let's check BGG. BGG yeah. seems to play that it is a two to four player. Exactly, yeah. I mean, if it has got a solo mode, then that's enough reason that I'll go out and get it and try it, you know, so I could play it. But I just didn't have the means to play it with a group regularly enough that I just decided to skip it. Um, you know, Rana Knizia is kind of hit and miss with me as just I games. Agree. I mean, he's, I he's made like... But then he's made thousands of games. <laughs> yeah. So it's like some of them are going to be bad and some of them yep. are going to be good. So it it sounds cool, but... I think there was two things that was hurting it. One I just mentioned with the player count, hmm. uh, but uh, even though I like city building games, so if it has got a solo mode, I'll buy it instantly and try it. But the other thing was that this came at a time when I was getting really bummed out about campaign games mm -hmm. because I think it, I was just in that thought process that everything's got to have a rotten campaign now. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the game is. It's like, if it's an adventure crawl campaign, fine. It's Polyamorous campaign. Yeah, but now everything's got a campaign. Doesn't matter what the game is. Somehow it's got to be legacy. And, and legacy was another thing. Like, uh, what was the? There was a Freedom and Freeze one uh, about collecting fruit and veg. Don't know. Uh, fabled, fabled fruits or oh, something like okay. that. Yep, that's the um, title. And it was a half decent card game, but it had a legacy element where the vegetables and that you, the fruit you used in different games changed. It's like for crying out loud, it's meant to be a simple card game. Why does everything have to be legacy or campaign now? And as soon as I saw My City come out, I thought, oh, okay, a two to four player city building game by Ge oh, Legacy. <laughs> and that just <laughs> instantly was a switch off. Because I can't play a lot of those games. Yeah. I skipped uh, Pandemic Legacy Season Zero, partially because I wasn't interested in the theme it had. But I just thought it took me ages to get through Pandemic Season 1 and 2 with a group of friends I have. I'm not doing another one as short as that. And I, I've even said to them, it's like, look, Apart from the adventure games I've got on my shelf, I'm done with campaigns with you lot because it takes us about a year to go through them. It took us forever to get through King's Dilemma. Mm -hmm. And that should have been done within a few weeks. It took us about a year thanks to COVID. And I said to them, look, no more games with campaigns. I'm just bringing single use games with one exception, Sleeping Gods. Yes, we definitely you mentioned that last up. week, yeah. yeah. After COVID, we're playing that. <laughs> so yeah, so for me, campaign games I find more annoying than legacy games. Legacy games, I will rush through and get them done. Campaign games, I don't feel that rush, and so then they just sit there and slowly clog up my shelves with like 14 different campaign games. Uh, but And I like Polyominoes. I figure this is on the lighter side, but past that, I I, I do agree with your general uh, burnout on the uh, the system of, of whatever, is, of legacy campaign. Yeah, so number and, and 11, is that good? Legacy, legacy greater than campaign, yeah. Yeah. I'd go with that. I mean, if, if I've got to tear up the game, like exit games and that, that's fine. I ain't got a problem with that because at least you get rid of them off your shelf. But, you know, campaigns just take forever. I mean, they've got so much. I don't even know how I'm going to store the Tainted Grail stuff over there. Oh, my there was, gosh. There was just one box before. Now I've got several. They won't fit on the Calyx shelf. So I don't know where I'm going to put them. But I've still got two campaigns to run through. And I've just spent ages going through one campaign from the stretch goals. It's like, I ain't got time to do these two campaigns and leave it on my table for all this time. So number 11 is going to be Tricarion by Mind Clash Games. Um, so you cut out it there. Was that Tricarion? Tricarion, yep. <sighs> Apparently you <laughs> uh, As soon as you mention a game, if I know it's on my shelf, I always get curious as to where it is, and it's literally behind my torso. Um, <laughs> the collector's box. Uh, whew. If you took the movie The Prestige and turned it into a board game, Tricarion would be it. It is a very done I adding to I'll my cart uh, check out and we're good to go perfect thank you 
<laughs> I think I'll leave it at that one because to describe it more would take longer than 10 seconds. But th- nah, I mean, this is a great heavy game. Not my favorite from Mind Clash, but w- enough that I bought the collector's edition from. But w- my friends had to teach me this one because I think I first got Anachrony mm-hmm. um, from them. And that was like fantastic. So, you know, jumped into that one. Then I think I was getting into Cerebria. Again, yeah. really fantastic. It's on the same shelf. And Jacarion was one that I had not tried, but I was waiting for friends to hurry up and teach me it because they had it and were fans of it. So it's like, look, I'm not playing it. I'm going you until you teach me it. Took us a fair while to get through it. That was a lot to teach. And it was certainly heavy as all get out, but fell in love with it just like the rest of Mind Clash's stuff. It, it instantly gave me that whole The Prestige as a board game because it's that whole feed of yes you are all magicians but you're kind of railing on each other like trying to usurp each other you know i want to get in the show and do these tricks oh wait get out of my show (laughs) i'm performing on this day not you (laughs) you know i want this assistant you know because it's worker placement to an extent so you're taking each other's spots yeah and i just thought it was really well represented yeah, it's it's got this beautiful look to it that is simultaneously mm-hmm. like not your typical like overproduced, flashy, pretty looking game, but manages to look very reserved and yet well presented at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. I know the theme. Uh, I like the idea of the prestige aspect. I love the prestige, one of my favorite movies. So mm-hmm. yeah, this has been very been on my radar for a while. I just really need to play Anachrony, and then I will immediately get this as soon as I do. But yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anachrony is definitely, I think, my favorite okay. of the three. But yeah, but that's like splitting hairs because I think they're all top 50 games. <laughs> all right. Number 12. It's going to be The Pillars of the Earth. Uh, yes. <laughs> that is still on my shelf, unsurprisingly. Nice. Um, Pillars of the Earth. The Pillars of the Earth is the worker placement game that completely destroys the cult of the new fanaticism that is going around these days. <laughs> Ooh, that's a solid way. That's a solid review right there. It's, I say, it is still on my shelf because this is an old game. It took me ages to get a copy of it before. Yeah. Because I think I had to buy it, it was, secondhand. And it was out of print for a while too. Yeah, I had to get it secondhand. And I, the expansion doesn't exist anymore. And I would love it, but I don't think I'll ever see it. But this is still on the shelf because it's just smooth elegant again i love that kind of a lightweight smooth elegant it's got a mechanic that's never been duplicated with the whole master builder pulling yeah. out the bag thing which i think works brilliantly in this if yeah some people go oh it's a bit random and it's like yeah but it's a light worker placement light <laughs> there's a little bit of randomness but it's still a hard decision to make but the game's like god knows how old and i would still happily play this work yes yeah, well that's old from old from our perspective no that's very old released yeah uh 2006 uh, 2006 yeah, so yeah. even older, and it's still a great game that I reckon would still do well this day, you know, with everyone sort of going, oh, what's the new hotness? It's like, I'll still play Pillars of the Earth. It would still be really yeah. good, build up a little cathedral. But it's also, it it does two, th- well, they're kind of linked. It introduced me to Michael Menzel as mm-hmm. an artist because he does the board, and Pillars of the Earth, I, I have an old photo somewhere that I used for my Facebook events for Portsmouth on Board, uh, my game club I run. And for ages, I used a picture of the Pillars of the Earth board that I took of a game I was playing because it still looks gorgeous with that board. And it was proof for me that a lot of people these days, they give a free pass to a lot of games that look aesthetically bleh, you know, horrible. And it's just like, you can't give a free pass to this in 2021. They say, well, but if I have it too pretty, it will be too busy and I won't be able to see stuff. And it's like, this yes, board that is, is true. so pretty and so functional. Yeah, it's, I get what they're saying. It's like, yes, you can make a board too pretty or too detailed that you can't tell what's going on. Pillars of the Earth destroys that whole thing because that is an example where you can have a nice, good looking board and functional. Yeah. So I completely agree. Pillars of the Earth is a game that's still in my collection that is. I mean, I haven't played it in a while, and I really need to get to the table. But I, I remember playing this at one point uh, doing candlelight. We had a power outage, and we literally put candles on the table and played Pillars of the Earth, which is great. Uh, but overall, it is a solid, like you said, it's a, it's a good entry-level worker placement. It's not breaking any, you know, amazing degrees of who knows what. It's no anachrony or, 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 um, or a trickarian or whatnot. But it is a solid, solid, solid game. It's both visually beautiful. Plus, if you're a fan of the book, which I certainly am, it's another level of, of interest in the game. So never, never. Well, it's never going to be something I would read, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I play yeah. it having no knowledge of the theme. I just go, look, it's your generic medieval theme, but it's got a cool mechanic that they've 
not used. Why has that Master Builder thing not been duplicated? I could see that working with modern board games fine. I mean, yes, you'll get a few people go, oh, it's random, and it's like, oh, do me a favor, so it's Terraforming <laughs> Mars. It's like, it's, you know, but light, right. elegant, 60, 90 minute Euro worker placement games. We just veered so far away from that these days, and I miss it. Yeah. All right, number 13 is going to be the third, and there might be more, but this is the third I know offhand. The third worker placement, not worker placement, darn it. I mean, yes, it is worker placement. Deck building with a board, Lost Wounds of Arnak. Oh, right. I didn't expect that to be the Because uh, we don't, th that's that, like but... worker placement, deck building, not deck building with a board. Yeah. But technically, it yeah. is deck building with a board. It is, te it is technically. It's just got a few things going on. <laughs> it's because it's, it's not as predominant, but, uh, well, you've seen my review, you know, on that one. Uh, the savior of 2020 this is just a board this is a board game that ticks every box for the criteria that i rate games with yeah i i i do know how you feel about it i'm okay with that this is one of two games on this list that i knew how you feel about um i think it's only two it might be more but i think there's two and this is it's it's amazing it's beautiful it's it's short it's accessible it's easy to teach it's easy to play uh this is one of my highlights of 2020 no question <laughs> Yeah, as I say, the Czech game edition shelf is like right down on the on the floor, pretty much. Uh, that alongside Under Falling Skies and a couple of others. But uh, this 2020 was been such a bad year for me for like games. You know, some people say, oh, the, you know, there was a great amount of games that came out, and I don't know where these went. Granted, there's a bunch I'm still playing at the moment, trying to catch up with UK releases. But uh, for the most part, I was thinking, how am I going to do a top ten this year? Because I just couldn't find ten games that I could shout home about. And then Check Game Editions basically said, well, here's two. <laughs> so it'll give you two games that you can. And Arnak just completely won me over. And it was just a, the biggest surprise because no one knew about it. And it just sort of came out as like, we've got something called Lost Ruins of Arnak. It's like, okay, random title. What's this about? Yeah. Got it, played it, and thought, this is amazing. I want to play it again. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I need to play it again, speaking of which. I already gave him like six, seven plays, but I need to play it again already. Okay. Number 14. Uh, 14, yes. Istanbul. Istanbul. Uh, see. Pretty lightweight engine builder. Does what it says on the tin. Just doesn't have... It doesn't have the theme and immersion to pull me back in for multiple plays, but I give it respect. Have you played the expansion? Uh, well, no. either expansion. What? No, no, I've only I've only played the base set when other people have bought the game themselves to play. Cool. So the reason I ask is because Istanbul is a game that for me, I played it, I thought it was pretty much what you said, interesting, solid, I see why people like it, and then I moved on from it. Uh, I got it back at one point later, uh, it's a gateway game to play, and then once I gave it a, a shot with the expansion, to me, and I played, I've only played with Mocha and Bakshish, there's also Letters and Seals, uh, but for me, it took it to that little bit of extra, extra level that I needed. It took it from a game that was solid, but like almost pre-scripted with like two or three paths, yeah. to giving you just enough enough extra choices and options that, I mean, thematically it's no different. Thematically it's going to be the same game. But yeah. in terms of the uh, puzzle on the table, it went from a game that I'm happy to pass on to a game that I'm very happy to own with that expansion. I'll I try again with that. I've heard good things. And yeah, I agree. Pre-scripted was a problem. You had yeah. two ways to win it as far as I'm aware. And you kind of just had to go one of those ways and stick with it. Yeah. So it was an interesting little puzzle, but like the, mm -hmm. it, it scripted to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't work. But that, that could work. I'd try it with the expansions. Champions of Midgard was a similar deal. I've passed on it. But I've not played it with Valhalla. And everybody says you and must play it with those expansions for it to shine. And it's like, cool, I will if someone would put it in front of me and yes. show me it. <laughs> I'm exactly the same place. Uh, Champions of Midgard is as well. And uh, that I played it. I've heard I have to play with expansion. I'm like, that's great. I liked it, but not enough to get my hands on the game and expansion again. But if I play it, I'll take note. <laughs> okay. Number 15 or 14. 14 is going to be Alien. No, uh, 15, no, we're on 15. 15. Alien Frontiers. All right, alien I was say there's a lot of things that start with alien, so it could be a few that flashed in. Alien frontiers. Hmm. Let's see. Despite its age, this is one of the worker placement dice games that I think still holds up, still remains in my collection, and beats out a lot of the more boring versions that have come out recently. 
that's a mostly, I would say I'm mostly in agreement with the exception that I don't have it in my collection, but I should. Uh, Alien <clears throat> Frontiers is one of my first dice placement games, and I adored it. Uh, over time, I eventually found that I didn't play it anymore. Uh, nobody asked for it, I didn't pull it out, and so it just wasn't hitting the table. But mm-hmm. I got rid of it because of lack of play, not lack of love. Uh, it's a game that I, I frequently have on my... I have a list of games that I want to get back, and then mm-hmm. I always decide one at a time which one's two, and Alien Frontiers is always on that list. Yeah, lack of play is the problem I've had lately just because of other games, but compared to a lot of the other dice worker placement ones, I got bored with Kingsburg and got rid of that one. Yep, I, didn't like, I didn't like Marco Polo at all. Um, yep. That one just really sort of hit me the wrong way. I'm trying to think of other ones. I know everybody Tassel, tried to cop- Burgundy. Is that that mechanic? I mean, it's what? to it's- a degree rolling dice and assigning them. That's true, but that's Stefan Feld, so we'll, uh, yep. <laughs> we'll leave it at that when it comes to my like the games. But uh, yeah, so there's just a lot of them that I never got into. But Alien Frontiers, theme wise and mechanic wise, stuck with me. It was pretty simple to play, but it had a really cool looking board, nice theme. Factions is a great expansion for it for yes. a bit of asymmetrical stuff. It just hasn't hit the table in ages but yes every time it comes up in conversation i think i want to get that out again yes <laughs> all right so on the most most on the same page i need i need to get this back i need to get rid of games and i need to get them back it's a problem number 16 is okay. oceans. Well, look on your sh- i'm looking at the shelf Sorry. behind you see if i can find any old ter- ones that you could get rid of i mean you don't need all that zombicide <laughs> stuff you could get rid of i'm that. getting rid of some of it i find i'm getting rid of some of it actually uh, i have too much zombicide i need to get rid of some of them yeah that would save a lot of space <laughs> <laughs> so number 16 is oceans not played uh the this one i mean when i saw it come out i know people have told me otherwise but it just gave me a sense of is this just basically evolution 2.0 or 1.5 which i've heard and, but i've heard was a good way i've heard it like it's evolution but better and and i think that was the thing it, i i wasn't the biggest fan of evolution mm-hmm. i thought theme was quite cool but it just it went on for quite a while. I didn't think what you were doing was that exciting in it, and I just thought like, I thought it was okay, but I just never really like got hooked on it. So when Oceans was announced, I thought okay, so it's just going to be the same thing, but with sea creatures. So I just didn't really give it a second look. But uh, try anything once, but no, that's going to be one that I just yeah. don't know. I'm in a similar place. I I plan on getting my hands on this one. I liked Evolution. I didn't love Evolution. Uh, if this is Evolution but better, it stands a chance of surviving. Because I like the concept. I just the, the actual implementation wasn't good enough. But we'll see. Uh, I expect it to go it's 50-50. It may, may be good enough, may not be. Yeah, I hear okay. good stuff from those who have it. I just don't know that there's that many people who do have it. <laughs> Number 17, I see on the shelf behind you, is going to be Citadels. Uh, yes. <laughs> Over that. Ooh. <laughs> Say, like I hate it. It's the worst. I should get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, said, I did a video where I said one of my little side videos where I said why something has gone up in rating, and that was the first one I did. Uh, I say, if you want, if you want the best example of a role selection game or Bruno for Duty that exists out there, Citadels is the game you have to get. <laughs> I'm down. With I that. love this game. <laughs> Yeah, Citadels is amazing. It, it, it's old. I mean, that's the. I, I think you have. Is that the re-implanted version that you have over there? Yeah, yeah. the master set version. Yeah. So I mean, it, I same game, it well. but they added extra cards, which is great. So that's so much variety. But the fact that they made the artwork so much better and put it as tarot-sized cards was just a. Yes. I mean, it's basically Citadel's master set. Yeah, I have that as well. Uh, Citadels is a one that I reliably pull out with new people, with Gateway, with regular gamers. It hits all those boxes. It plays in around 45 minutes, gives you a decent amount of depth and options, and the variability, if you have that master set, is just off the charts. Mm. Uh, checks all the boxes. If it was a longer game, I probably wouldn't own it, but it, for the 45 minutes, for the 30 to 45 minutes it takes, I, I love what it's doing. Yeah, Gateway, not as keen. Role selection, trying to learn the eight characters sometimes throws off a few gateway gainers and you're playing it quick if you're doing it in 30 minutes so you usually find it's about an hour but uh, 30 minutes i find is with uh, only with people who know the game 45 is usually more normal and i suppose it depends on player count but yep. uh that's the yeah, first time the, i've ever heard i'm quick at a game usually i'm on the slow end usually i'm like it takes two and a half hours people are like why is it taking you more than 90 minutes oh i get that all yeah. the time but i mean <laughs> 30 minutes for that game if i'm playing it two player i guess but uh yeah, oh, well, I we just... do usually play it at lower play accounts that might be it we usually probably play it at around four maybe five it's rare we get six or seven Oh, I wouldn't ever play it with more than five. It's just too okay. long then. But it's usually at least an hour with 
four or five. I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm just playing with slow people. I think at my club, it seems yeah. <laughs> that's what people tell me. But nah, I absolutely adore that game. <laughs> yeah, solid game. All right, number eighteen is going to be Mission Red Planet. <laughs> Same Lich- theme. Yep. It's it's literally just out of shot next door to it. Oh, <laughs> is it nice? Okay, perfect. <laughs> I was um, gonna, I, I specifically put these two together, and uh, we'll get to why in a second. But I'll let you do your review first, because like that entire column is pretty much a uh, fantasy flight. Um, over that, uh, there's a one of the best area control games I've played. A decent evolution to Citadel's uh, suitable. One of the few games that works with six players. Ooh. Oh, now you're. I mean, I mean, COVID has me not playing with six these days, but now I'm a little more intrigued no. for if or when COVID is, you know, no longer a factor in game mm. night. So Mission Red Planet for me is a game that I, I played. And the reason I lumped, lumped, lumped them together, this and Citadels, is to me, I felt the extra game time Mission Red Planet added wasn't worth the degree of how much better it was than Citadels. That's my mm. overall. Yeah, the I mean, Citadels, if I want a quicker game, I'll take citadels out the the role selection in mission red planet isn't quite the same as citadels in the sense that you're not choosing from a same deck yeah you've got your own nine characters so it kind of bears a bit more resemblance to something like aquatica and dare i say it concordia but, you know a few of those <laughs> a, a few of those other games where you've got a set number of cards and then you pick from those and bring them out actually no concordia is a bad example where uh, raptor would be a good one the two-player oh, okay. game uh, yep yep Two player had the same thing. You've both got nine cards, and those are the nine you use. But so I've, it, it differentiated enough from Citadels in that respect. But this was like an area control game where it's like when I explain it to people, it's just like, look, bog standard. Here's your astronauts. There's the planet. Most wins get stuff points. You know, it's like, yeah, so sort of dirt simple. But you've got the tension with going on certain ships. You know, some will blow up. The pilot changing the destination is always hilarious. Uh, People fighting over territories, the hidden cards you put underneath or something looks absolutely gorgeous in its second edge because I was all Dice Tower kept going on about was this game is really great and doesn't exist. Well, if it did, I'd get it. And then they reprinted it and sort of forget. But I stand by that six player thing because there are not a lot of Euro games I want to play with anything more than four. That's why the six player thing gave me pause because it wasn't that Mission Red Planet was a bad game for me. It's that it was, I felt better than Citadels, but much longer for me and not enough better but the six player thing is a different different reason to own it entirely because i have like two games on my shelf that are decent longer games not partyish mm-hmm. games that play well with uh six but yeah yeah six for most euros will take too long but the i mean it's definitely longer than citadels but the longest i've had a mission red planet game go is 90 minutes and that's perfect length for a game for me but Interesting. With six, it doesn't seem to take much less time or more time with more players because the role selection is simultaneous. simultaneous. Yeah. So the only thing that takes a little bit longer is just resolving a certain few other things, but it really doesn't add a lot of time. So to get a six player done with a Euro style game in 90 minutes is a rarity for me. Cool. So number 19 is going to be Mission, is that Clash of Cultures? I was going to say, is there anything else with Mission? No, no, no. It's Mission, mission Apocalypse. Uh, oh, no. Ashley Gultures. Ooh. There's a, uh, this one I have played a few times. Not in a long time, though. Same. I know. It's... <laughs> it's a... Generally a solid, heavy civilization game that I want to like more, but I'm not convinced the technology tree is entirely balanced. Oh, Luke, I like you so much today. Oh my gosh. When I, like, have we disagreed on like much? We've like been minimal degrees of disagreement. This your other list, our our other video was much more uh had a few differences of opinions. Uh yeah, I completely agree. Clash of Cultures to me is a beautiful game that I'm looking forward. You know there's a reprint coming, right? There is, and if they fix the problems I had with the first one, I'll be all over it. Yep, yeah, that's so so for me, Clash of Cultures was an excellent game that the tech tree I didn't think was balanced and overall it was a little bit more fiddly than I would like, uh, compared to what it was given me. But I am looking forward to that monumental edition or whatever they're coming out with because yeah, if it in right. any way improves upon the original, I already like the original. Yeah, I mean it, it was a Sith game. I love a good Sith game. The, yep. It's one of the few examples where this game might take longer than the three hours. I'll still play it because you see a beginning and an end. Yes. You know, this is what I've built up, and it's different from yours. Cash of Cultures had that 
sort of feel but yeah a ton of fiddly rules it was probably a bit too combat heavy for my liking because i know it's called clash of cultures but it seemed like the whole game was pretty much about clashing yeah. <laughs> rather than anything else rather than the culture but that tech tree as good a system as that was and that's what brought me in i thought oh yes this cool variable tech tree and i can do a different path this is great it then sort of went well hang on that blatantly doesn't seem anywhere near as good as getting that this seems ah this tech tree has got a bit scripted oh no <laughs> and that's when yeah things started to go but if they bring out this new edition and they balance a decent tech tree that means i don't have to be a combat munchkin in order to do well then sold <laughs> yeah right there with you number 20 is going to be forbidden stars that's strangely still on my shelf <laughs> you are like you're doing so much better like i think you only haven't played two of these or something like that. maybe three played a played a word but it, well it's on my shelf with an asterisk that's okay insane. it's like <laughs> Oh, I don't know. They, it's a highly complex, highly thematic, highly enjoyable 40k board game that is almost impossible to get to the table, but you will never want to sell it because you'll never see it again. Uh, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. So I have played this only once. Uh, I played with somebody who was not interested in it, but I was very interested. I really enjoyed what was happening here. And I have it on my list to get out, but it's hard to get to the table. And it's, I have to teach it entirely again to mm. new people. Uh, but I, I'm still holding on hope to the idea that this will see the table. And it's right up my alley in terms of everything mm. the game is doing. It's three times I've played it. Probably only three times I've played it. I don't think I've even played all four factions in it. Mm. And... You know, I can't remember who I haven't played. Probably the basic Space Marines because I just get bored yeah. by those. But the the game itself is just really good. And this is another one of those. Oh, this is going to take longer than three hours. I don't care because the combat's fun. The asymmetry is fun. It's forty k. I used to play forty k models back in the teenage age, uh, like Necrons and Tau and Orcs and stuff. You know, I was a good fan of that. And the game itself is really good fun. But my and it's the same bloke who I mentioned has all those long games like yes. Merchants and Marauders. It's like he's the only one I would get to play this with. We'd have to relearn all the rules. If you're teaching a new player, you're going to be there for a long time. It's got no solo mode. And because Fantasy Flight lost the license, it will never get the expansion we wanted, which it badly kind yeah. of needed. I was looking forward to Necrons and Tau being in that game. I'd have been all over it. But I cannot bear to sell it because I know that when I play it, I'll enjoy it. And if I do sell it, I'll never see it again. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the Fantasy Flight Fight may reprint it one day. I mean, this is a reprint of StarCraft already, um, and then they lost license to to this one, which meant they never released all the expansions of the development they were hoping for. But if they reprint it, uh, I, I'd be I'd be paying attention. Although then I'd feel bad they didn't sell my copy where I could have. But mm. it is what but it is. But the thing is, yeah. But if someone reprints it, it's never going to look as good. Yeah, StarCraft still holds its value. That's an interesting. StarCraft still manages to be like two hundred dollars for it. So maybe this will be the 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 be mm. be around. Okay, 21 is going to be Endeavor Age of Sail. Ah, a friend of mine's a fan of this one and showed showed me it. Uh, Otherwise known remember. as I am not. <laughs> I'm not what? No, you said my friend of mine is a fan of it. Otherwise known as I'm not a fan of it. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, no, I'm, well, we'll explain it we'll in see. a minute. But I mean, it's, I say it's a, try they get surprisingly enjoyable euro just very dry and you know is one that i'll play just didn't really seek out it okay it's hard to really describe that one into no no i'm okay with that I've... i'm okay with that i happen to still own this game and because I, I think it is an enjoyable little puzzle but it mm. is one of the games that i frequently give a look at when i'm debating which games to keep or not keep yeah, it. I've only the thing is, this is a bit like Istanbul and Champions of Midgard and that. Yes. Because he, I've played it with this friend of mine. He's a you know good friend of mine and his wife. We uh, we play a lot of the Euro meaty stuff like the Chikari on the Nat together. But he is a, a big fan of what we jokingly term beige Euros. Like mm -hmm. you find the ones with Latin names that like Forenza and a few of the others, like or stupid Latin names that no one knows what they mean that look beige quintessential area control euro or something it's like that's what he's a fan of and i we always joke about that with him so he has this game and they they both really enjoy it i played it and thought it was enjoyable but it's i know it's got a ton of modules you can add to it yes. before you even get into expansions and i feel like i need to try it with some of those to give it a bit more interesting sort of so variety in that I'm actually more interested in the expansion. I have the expansion. I'm more interested in getting that to the table than the modules. I found the modules to be 
overly complex in how much you have to understand to implement them. Uh, it's not right. that they're bad. I think they added a lot. It's just I feel something got missed in terms of the complexity of explaining what is a small set of extra rules. All right. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd try it with modules or the expansion. I'd certainly try the game again. I'm just... The thing is, I struggled to explain it in 10 seconds because I struggled to remember what you actually <laughs> did in the game because I remember... You, you put down pieces to lock down benefits. Then if your pieces meet other pieces, you get other benefits. Then you're putting out cards in the various different uh, colonies around the board to yeah. get more benefits. Ultimately, the whole thing comes down to getting these tokens on the board. It's just different ways of getting the tokens and then yeah, upgrading your a... boards and whatnot. I remember enjoying the puzzle and feeling that, right, I'm doing this differentiated path to what someone else is doing. So I do remember enjoying it, but I still stick by the fact that it was bone dry because the theme was like nonsensical for the most part, or at least it didn't come out for me. And I struggled to remember what I did in it because, again, it's this is what every Euro game does. It's like, here's your method of getting victory points. Here's the mechanic that lets you do it. And it's just like... I remember enjoying it, but I can't remember what we were supposed to be doing. What, what was the objective apart from game victory points? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't disagree. Again, I, I like it. I recommend it, but I also give it an eye when I'm debating what to get rid of. Yeah. I'll, I'll play it again, but only with expansion stuff added. I need to check out what it can be. I feel like it's lacking a bit in base set alone. That's reasonable. Number 22 is going to be The Reckoners. Mm. Not played... Oh, but this is the man. one, the Kickstarter, yeah. that I, whenever it comes out on Kickstarter with expansion that, or when I see it on a retail website, I think I could buy it now if I wanted. I'm always wondering if I will enjoy it or not. It's the most tempting big pricey game I think that's out there. So I can tell you that I love this game. Like, I really do. It's a lot of fun to play. It's very accessible. It teaches surprisingly easy. It's easy to get people up and running. It's fun to Yahtzee up your dice and get a powers and abilities and level up and take out the bad boys. And if you know the Reckoners or if you know the boys, either of those intellectual properties will feel like you're in that universe. Uh, the one complaint I have, which is a fairly big complaint, is it's very samey. Like, I, I'm getting the expansion that just came out on Kickstarter because I want to see if it makes it less samey. But this is a game where I can only play it, like, once every few months because if i play it rapid fire i'll be like i just played the same game and i just played the same game i need to have it spread out in order to not feel mm. like i'm just playing the same game i'd heard people mention that and that was a bit of a worry i think the fact that it was a dice game slightly put me off it as mm. well because i thought okay this sounds like a grittier sentinels in the multiverse for me but i'm just rolling dice and matching the symbols and stuff is, mm. is that going to give me any kind of theme or is it no just sentinels is much dice, better but... this this is a good this is a good job at capturing the theme from an overhead level of feeling like you're fighting back but your actual abilities feel so abstracted compared to sentinels sentinels mm. like as fiddly as sentinels is the actual cards and like you know i have a freeze ray or i have a this or bunker will do his blast and all these things like they actually feel like mm. abilities in, in Reckoners, everything feels a little abstracted when you drill down to the level of actual abilities. The overarching theme works. The the drill down mm. is very abstracted. But you can buy Sentinels for about £25 and get that, yeah. that play set with a ton of stuff in it. This was like, if I'm buying this, I'm investing a lot in a gamble as yeah. to whether I like it. And you mentioned the IPs. I've, I mean, I don't really read, so I've never read the Reckoners property, even though the concept sounds cool. Sure. The idea that they're superheroes and they're all bad. Um, I had to be convinced to watch The Boys because uh, uh, I, I came into it quite late. I think when season two was getting announced, I thought, fine, I'll watch season one and find out what it's like. Because I like cheesy superheroes in a sense. You know, I watch all the sure. Marvel and DC stuff, but I watch all the CW stuff like The Flash and Arrow and that. And people will go, oh, that's really cheesy, that stuff. Is it it? Is. Yeah, but it's the quintessential lighthearted i'm a superhero i save the day i've got problems i can be dark and gritty but at the end of the day i'm still somebody you're rooting for the idea that the boys was going to tell me you're going to hate every superhero in this series because <laughs> they're just complete like douches it's like i don't want to necessarily be in that world but i did watch the boys and i did mostly enjoy it i did gotcha. think what it was trying to do was done pretty well and there were some pretty cool characters and stuff like that i think the problem with the boys I have is that it just went too slow. Yeah, you know, I don't disagree with that. Season one more than season two, but I don't disagree. I don't disagree in general. Yeah, season two was a a step up. I think that was more enjoyable. But they they both seasons start off great, get boring in the middle, and then pick up at the end, and it keeps going into side plots and with people and that. And I suppose it depends. I don't go for the corporate stuff in it, where. Okay. 
you see like oh this is advertising and all that. Over. I get I yeah, I get what it's trying to do. It's satire the, the whole thing, but it's kind of like I'm not in, I get I get it. This company <laughs> is horrible. We don't like them. It's like I'm I get it. Can we move on to these cool heroes and you know their turmoils and stuff? But then there was also like some characters like more than others. You know, I like seeing what Homelander does. I like seeing what Starlight does and a couple of the others. But I could not give a monkey's about the deep. Yes. <laughs> Diverting to him. And I'm sick and tired of his character. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, so it, it's like I say, it's a hit and miss series. But I'm, I'm in when Boy Season 3 get, comes out, I'll watch it. However, from what I've read, because I've not obviously read any of the graphic novel thing it's based on, the stuff that they're going to put on screen for season three it's like yikes <laughs> oh i've seen i've seen those things show up in my google news feed <laughs> okay yeah. um but, nah, then... but yeah i mean back to the recorders I, I i would try but i just i can't spend that much money on a yep. gamble i need to be shown this game that's reasonable I, I guess the big thing is when you do try it uh, just understand that the first play is going to feel similar to your second and third again i still like it i still own it uh but i definitely play it infrequently because of that okay number 23 is going to be Nemesis. Ah, Nemesis. <laughs> uh, no, this, this is the game that I'm hoping I'm going to like more and more as time goes on. Uh, but is that, For me, there is no better representation of the movie Alien than this game. It just could do with a bit of shortening on the time length. <laughs> it... But this is one that I feel like is going to get better because I've same bloke with the big games. This is how I got introduced to Nemesis, and theme wise, ten out of ten or eleven out of ten. Yeah. It's like fantastic. This is AD on the board game. Uh, you know, gameplay great fun. I have had joking scenarios with like friends, particularly when you're playing semi co op. Yeah, you know, where you've got them, so it's like you know. You know, sorry that I'm screwing you around. Yes, you're the guy in the wheelchair, but I don't care. If my mission <laughs> is to kill you. It's going to happen. I've shut you in the pod. It's going to, you know, great laughs. Two biggest problems, though, is that if you play this with slow players, this game is agonizingly long. <laughs> it's like it can take a bit too long. And I felt that some aspects of the game just didn't, you never did. You know, you wander around the locations, you get mm -hmm. maybe like one item. I wish you could get a bit more. Okay. And you, may set the coordinates or you may mess up the engine but eventually usually the self-destruct goes off and you deal with that but you also had this stuff with researching the aliens and i just i've never played a game of nemesis where anyone's done that because it's it's very specific as to how because you've got to get alien corpses for it and it's like well killing the things is hard enough mm -hmm. um so i was kind of hit and miss on it then the kickstarter came out for the lockdown one which kind of feels a bit more like doom than it does okay. alien but no oh, well still like both but when I thought, okay, they've got a solo mode, they've improved on it, because I feel like I would enjoy the game more solo than I would multiplayer. Uh, it sounded like they'd made improvements. It looked like it was a bit more condensed down. And, that, and I thought, okay, I'll back lockdown. Then being a completionist, I decided to buy the entire lot. But <laughs> yep. it was good value. It was it a was lot of money. one of my most expensive Kickstarters to date. I got paid at the time, side client. And I thought, you know what? buy the whole lot of nemesis every alien everything and i'm hoping that this will be a case that i'll play it more solo or just play it more often and i'll go yeah why didn't i think this was amazing at first off i think it's just every time i've played it it's like come on this is going on a bit long <laughs> yeah and i know people who like lockdown more than alien and, and more than nemesis i know the reverse so it could go either direction in terms of which is pref which is preferred but or yeah, is that people who have previewed it, I guess. Yeah, people have previewed it. Yeah, small, small, smaller subset of people. But I've heard. Uh, I mean, I haven't heard anyone who disliked it in terms of playing it. But I think they're coming out as being fans of Nemesis to begin with, so they're similar enough. But just in terms of preference, cool. Yeah, I'm. I'm right there with you. I'm, I have not played. I, I'm actually. I haven't actually played mine yet. Uh, but I basically backed the Kickstarter, and I am looking forward to seeing what it does on my table. Number twenty-four is going to be the second CG game, Under Falling Skies. Oh, that was on the list. <laughs> yes, these are the this one and on the Arnak are the only two that I again I think the only two that I know how you feel about, but I just don't talk with them because I like them. Yeah, I mean, Space Invaders, the dice game, one of the top ten solo games I would recommend for people. It's yeah. it's a solid it's a solid game. I mean, you cannot help but make Space Invaders and Independence Day references while you're doing it. I know my video made enough of them, and. It's like I say, very simple rules, but when you add the campaign bits in and you've cannibalized that, you've got a decent amount of variety in how you play it. 
once you're comfortable with it, you wrap up the game in about 20, 30 minutes or so. It just, again, it's just one of those tick the boxes. I've only got very minor quibbles with it. Completely agreed. This has become uh, definitely like I did a top 10 solo games at one point, which I need to redo that video at some point in time mm-hmm. because my current top 10 has definitely shifted and Under Falling Skies is very much in my top 10 solo games. Yeah, I've been told to redo my top 10 solo list. <laughs> it's a couple <laughs> of years old, I think. And despite the fact last year I did a big thing on explaining all these different types of solo games, people have asked me, it's like, you're going to do an updated top 10 solo list. It's yeah, like, enough things come I... out. And like something I didn't play, like Terraforming Mars Solo, I never played back when I did that list. And that, I mm. love playing that one solo. So like, it, it, it's so many different experiences out there that have shifted how I rank, rank my top 10. But yeah, mm. some, but... some of the same. Okay, number 25, I think we're up to 25 is going to be Shadows Over Camelot. Oh, that's old school. Do I still own that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, apparently, it is still on my shelf. But Nice. Ooh, it, it's on the cusp. It's always it's in that 7 out of 10 category where I'm yes. like, is it shelf-worthy now? But I, I know, if, you, if you want a co-op game where everybody is quoting Monty Python every five seconds, this is the one to get. <laughs> It, That's... It's a solid co-op. I just haven't brought it to the table in so long because I've wanted to bring other co-ops out. I don't know. I, I think it's one that we played to death in the past and it's kind of showed its age a bit. Yes. Uh, there's not enough to bring me back to it with the whole poker-style hands in it, but it's still a good game and I've got memories of it, but it is basically a case of how much do I want to quote Monty Python right now? Fine, I'll play Shadows of a Camelot. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. Shadows of Camelot was an excellent game back in the day that I played a lot, and then I got rid of it because while it is or was solid, I think it represents the, an older style of cooperative game that has seen a lot of innovation since then. And so while, I mean, I can say, I can completely, I'd happily play it. If anyone wants to stand and play it, I'd play it. But yeah, I got rid of it a few years ago. It's The nostalgia factor is what's keeping it on the shelf, but I think at some point it's going to have to go it's got the expansion in it although i don't use much of it yeah you know i just got it for variety but i just don't see myself bringing it out often you know if i've got that many players i'll be playing a party game usually rather than a big co-op and mm-hmm. i mean i suppose if you're saying well what about a six seven player game that you can play with a traitor in it i've now got obscurio on my shelf Ooh, with the uh, that one with the uh, dixit cards and i think i'd rather play that than shadows of a camelot so it's i just don't see it hitting the table anymore great cool. but great game but probably a bit dated number 26 the quest for el dorado not played uh, <gasps> of all the ones you've played of all the things i thought i might miss you on this is one you haven't played it i don't know i, I heard it was a weird abstracted racing game yeah but it is it is a deck builder isn't it yes it is i don't know perhaps oh, this the... is deck building with a board hey look at that we have another one hmm. i mean Perhaps it's the look of it. Perhaps it was the theme behind it. I don't know. Just something about it just made me kind of skip it in favor of other stuff. I don't if, know if I'd like it or not. I if, if there's one game that I think is worth picking up, because you can get this fairly cheap usually, um, mm. I would say this is worth giving a shot. This is the possibly one of the most, I have to think, I have to look at my collection, but this might be the best combination of a deck builder with a board that I own in terms of really feeling that you need that board because it's it's straight up a racing game across the full board. But uh, yeah, I like this one a lot. But I have the expansions. How do you actually, I mean, how does it work with the deck building side of it? Because if it's just basically a race game, are you literally just collecting cards to move? It's primarily, so this is basically the board is set up in different terrain types, and you're going to need different cards to traverse different terrain types. So I'll need more green cards to traverse the jungle, more money to traverse the villages, more canoes to traverse the water. And you're doing that along with ability cards that will do things, anything from weeding your deck to drawing extra cards, to letting you ta- move through any spot, to letting you get in the way of people. There's all these different things you can do through the cards. Uh, the core game, I think, is incredibly solid, but will get tiring over time as multiple plays in, you're, it's basically the same idea. The question is, do you try to weed or develop a deck in the beginning of the game as fast as possible, falling behind mm-hmm. but then catching up through a more efficient deck? Or do you just try to do a combination of building a streamlined deck, streamlined deck as you run? But ultimately it comes down to matching your cards to the train types and while buying more cards to increase what you can do and how fast mm-hmm. you can do it. Basically just a race, uh, but for the half an hour playtime, maybe 45 minutes in the slower game, uh, it is one of my favorite deck builders of the board. I mean, it is quick. Uh, maybe it was a combination of Ravensburger with Reiner Knizia, and it maybe something put me off. Because I mean, I 
I don't mind Reinick and Itzia, but I don't get excited for yep. new stuff from here. And I think Ravensburger, I sort of look at it and go, oh, is this going to be like a game you'd find in Walmart or Asda in our case, you know, and think, is, like, is this really a game for gamers or is this more of a family gateway yeah. thing? But I mean, Vincent Dutre artwork, I mean, at least it would look good. It is, a, it is a deck builder with a board, so part of me is like, yeah, maybe I really should hurry up and try this one. <laughs> it's worth a shot. It's, it's, it's. I mean, not, not necessarily for everyone, but like a 7.6 on Board Game Geek with a, rate, a weight of 2, which I think is uh, on the, I think both those are on the ball. It's not an amazing game, but it's a solid game I pull out with 2, 3, or 4 players, more 3 or 4, uh, when I want to give it a shot. I've heard a lot of people say it does play well with 2. BGG, in fact, ranks it best with 2 as one of the options. For myself, I prefer 3 and 4, but all either way, it's a solid experience. Yeah, I mean, I would only play it with three and four because two players harder for me to get to the table than a solo game. Yeah, but I mean, it looks nice from the picture. It's a deck builder. Yeah, I suppose I gotta just give this one a shot once I can actually play it. I mean, I think there's a mod for it for TTS, or perhaps it's on Board Game Arena. I'm gonna have yeah, to look this one up. Over time, this, this will be the one from this set of thirty that I'm like, okay, <laughs> this will be the one I actively need to pursue. Okay, and I believe that's 25, 26, 27, 27. 27, we are on Maracaibo. Mm-hmm. I don't want to sound... Um, uh, this is going to be good and mean, though. Uh, <laughs> that's the best kind. That's interesting. I know. Is that... the... the one game from this designer that was worthy enough to hit my shelf. If you're a fan of multi-use <laughs> cards, this is one that will... That that will you will enjoy quite a bit. Okay, it, it it's a lovely bloke, but his games don't tend to sit well with me. I mean, oh my goods was good once it got into second edition. It was broken mm. the first time, you know. But couldn't can't stand Great Western Trail. Have no interest in Mombasa. Didn't really hook on the Blackout Hong Kong or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, the what was it called the. Road to Everdale, Newdale, or something. Road to Newdale. Oh, something Newdale. Um, expeditions yeah. to Newdale, which which is basically oh my goods. If you want to make it more random and longer, and it's like why? <laughs> and it it's kind of like I haven't necessarily gravitated towards his games. Maracaibo is the one game that is still on my shelf for the time being because mechanically I do really like it. But Interesting. that that has a bit of an asterisk as well because people I've played it with have not gravitated to it as much as other ones like you know they'll be fans of great western trail but they haven't liked maracaibo as much because they're not a fan of the whole like england france combat cube part of it or something that they didn't like that mechanic uh and for me i like it's the cards that draw me in because the campaign is a waste of space it's like there's no story in this game there's no theme it's just bring her in a roses on a is a bait is a giant rondelle yeah. with more yeah. used cards but the cards are so good in that system because not only have i got three uses per card because i love like valley of the kings behind me and stuff i love games where i've got a card and i've got multiple reasons like do i use it for that or this or that uh, and this one has you cycling through the cards at such a rapid rate that you get to see a lot of them and make the choices it's not like well here's my 10 cards i better this is all i'm gonna see this game so it, it's enticed me in for that reason. I don't know how much longer I'll hold on to it, though, because it's not getting the plays, and I don't have a massive desire to play it solo because the campaign doesn't really do it for me. I mean, it, it technically has a story, but there's no story in this. It's, it's like, I don't think people are going to admit to that. It's just it's just a variable setup board. So, But yeah, this this is his, this alongside the, orig- the second edition of Oh My Goods is kind of like, hmm. Yeah, you know what? These are the games from this designer I go for, but it's just a personal preference. I know that his yeah. games are no, I, horrendously I don't popular. Great Western Trail, I liked it, but didn't keep it. Uh, most of his games that I've played, I have not kept at the end of the day. I do have Expeditions to New, never Newdale unplayed on my shelf, um, and I do have Maracaibo unplayed on my shelf. Those are the ones I need to give a shot mm-hmm. to. Uh, but Maracaibo is the one that I definitely am holding up more hopes to just for the rating alone. And um, yeah, I'll see how it plays out. But uh, I agree in general, his stuff have been good, but not amazing for me. Yeah, it's just, like I said, it's just that style of Euro. I mean, take a flip side, Vital Asurda is populating an entire shelf behind me. The Mind Clash stuff is behind me. The heavy, a heavy Euro that is highly thematic has got more chance to sing with me than a heavy Euro that isn't because the theme will make up for shortfalls more than other parts. Like I can forgive a little mechanical fault if the theme still keeps me engaged, but also they're just more enticing. You know, to play a three-hour game about 
time travel and robot mechs and stuff like that with anachrony is a lot more interesting than playing a three hour euro about coal and iron you know it's yeah. it's, it's, it's just a, a personal thing with that and Maracaibo is a fun game but it doesn't really have a theme to speak of so it's a case of how long do i hold on to it because i just i think the main reason i still hold on to it is because i've got when e-raptor was sending me stuff for free to show off on the channel they sent me like the insert as well as the overlays ah. um mm. so it's kind of like if i sell it i gotta get rid of all of that as well <laughs> and it's like technically i've got a good way to bring it onto the table so maybe i just need to play it at some point and rekindle it a bit but you need those overlays cool well, seriously 28. alex is like, right? alexander enough with the brown discs <laughs> <laughs> you'll know what i mean when you play it <laughs> no i see the pictures i know what you're talking about but okay 28 is going to be uh dice throne either season one or season two either one not played <laughs> not played again the uh, ones oh my gosh cool. i think it looked like i mean a, a dice game has got to entice me in a bit more because i sort of go all right well what can you do with dice to an extent mm. that hasn't been already done I didn't know much about it. It sounded like it was going to be generic fantasy. And then this whole season one and season two made me think, is this just a campaign investment thing again? Or is it? No, not this I, I just haven't researched it enough. Cool. It's so one of the on. ones that it's moved under the radar. <laughs> okay, so another 28 instead is Viscounts of the West Kingdom. <laughs> Ooh. Let's see that. So close to usurping Architects of the West Kingdom, it's unreal. But this is one of the best dry mechanical Euros I have played and possibly one of the best solo Euro game implementations mm. I've played. Interesting. So Viscounts is one of the few I haven't played yet, and I am looking forward to getting some to the table. I've read the rulebook. I, I'm all prepped to go, mm. but I haven't actually I, played this one. I, I love this one. It doesn't quite beat Architects. I think Architects is slightly more enjoyable, just it's a bit easier to get to the table, works better for multiplayer. But this one, I thought, it's a bit like Arnak. It's got that tiny little bit of deck building that isn't really deck building. It's more tableau management. And yes, it's very dry. It's like build here, weird castle mechanic here or something. But it just mm -hmm. blends. It is very smooth. It's got the variety of all the townsfolk that you can get each game. But I think the biggest draw is just that solo mode is so good. You good get the know. full field of the game, four different ways, to, four different Automna boards, but it's a very simple and very challenging Automna. It's like I say, I won't spoil too much more because you've obviously got to play it yourself. But I gave this one a 10. I mean, it is. Oh, wow. My, it is Solid. my second. It's my second favorite of Garp Pill's games. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> 29 PAX Premier Second Edition. You're fortunate I've actually played this one. Because <laughs> so, normally I would never touch this kind of game. But, oh yeah. I was gonna say, surprisingly more enjoyable than I expected it to be for a game that is played on a tablecloth. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, it's, I mean, I, I thought it was fine, but I normally would not touch this game. It was only because the same friend who likes beige euros decided, you know, I want, I'll try anything once, I'll try it, it was getting the buzz. And I sort of thought, okay, we're playing it on a tablecloth with pastel-coloured statue pieces. So I thought, okay, this is abstracting it a bit, but fine. <laughs> it's pr it's pretty-ish. Uh, I think the problem I had with it was, I mean, it can be very mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are kind of each on its face. It's not a short game by any means. Yeah. Um. But, I mean, I, I kind of enjoyed it. I liked the sort of card tableau puzzle that you had. I thought it was a bit weird that you had spies that move across from card to card. Yeah. One of the things I thought that was like, yep. was like, that's a weird mechanic in itself. I think the only problem I had were, and I, I did like the idea that you had a different, you wanted a different faction to win and you kind of goaded them into doing stuff like that. That, that was good fun. So I did enjoy it overall. It's just not a theme I'm interested in. So it's I was kind of playing it, and these cards are coming out that are obviously based on something out of history, and, and I've got no idea what any of them are. It's like playing Twilight Struggle. Yeah, so I, I mostly agree. I thought it was an interesting game. It's a fine game. I wouldn't turn it down. I had no interest in owning it, though. Uh, primarily for me, I think it was the, the, the level of text and stuff going on in the cards and the quantity of cards in the game. I felt like I was spending half my, my time just trying to constantly keep up with what the cards were on the table. Uh, it's a problem I have in some, in some games, in other games as well, like Innovation or even Evolution and Oceans, like we talked about earlier. 
Mm. Uh, some games I need them to, I need to be, feel like I'm playing the game more than I'm constantly just reading text on cards. Um, and I like the system of Pax Mimir, and I'm happy to play it, but I just didn't want to own it because of that. Yeah, I mean, innovation's got a lot of effects, although they're simpler. As the cards and packs were quite complex in how they worked, and yeah. it, as the game progressed, it became harder and harder to understand what the other players were doing. <laughs> yes, which I don't like. I, I don't like it when I have to sit there and either look at four different people and constantly be on top of their stuff, or just resign my, myself to the fact that I'll be surprised with things that will hurt me. Hmm. But yeah, cool. Okay, and I think that takes us to 30. Uh, 30 is going to be Rajas of the Ganjas. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was like, is that, this has got to be a big one to end on. Uh, well, I've still got this one. Just sure with that. Uh... Uh, one of the few Euro games that proves to you that it's not all about gaining victory points. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. I like it, that. It's... It's kind of weird to describe. I mean, it's, it's got a bit of everything in it. You've got dice manipulation. You've got a little carcass or an element with the tiles, and it is very mechanical. Mm-hmm. You know, here's your fairly busy board. I'll give it that. Here's some tracks to move up and stuff. Uh, but what you do with the dice is pretty cool. I do like the fact that you put them on essentially a statue of Buddha, like each hand holding a yes. die or so it's quite an interesting little gimmick and the dice are cool i mean it's big chunky colorful dice you've seen me with seasons it's a similar sort of feel so at least it's very well produced the it's still on my shelf i just haven't brought it out in a while but it's, it's kind of weird part of me sort of thinks i shouldn't like it but the mechanics blend well together and i think a lot of it is down to the fact that it is not a victory point game mm-hmm. you granted it's kind of like well yeah you've still got to reach a certain point before you win but it's kind of a race and how you do it is up to you. You know, you, you. I mean, have you played it? Is, is this one you've yeah, played? No, I, I played it. I played. I wanted. To, I wanted to end the one I actually played it. Uh, played, but Raj of the Ganges is one that I. I actually I got rid of it initially when I first played it uh, because I thought I liked it, and then I kind of set myself on play, and I didn't pull it out, and I got rid of it, and then I kind of missed it and got it back, which is happens, but infrequently. And I've really been enjoying it. It's I. I to some extent I shouldn't enjoy it, not necessarily for the same reasons as you, but because. The game is basically the same game every single time. It doesn't really mix mm. it up. But I, I still find it appealing enough. The 90-minute playtime, the rolling dice, mm. building out your carcass on board, all the things it does of just, like, the unlocking your extra workers, all this stuff is just fun. It's It somehow manages to be more appealing than I would think it would be. Yeah, the dice... The dice and Carcassonne stuff and that is is fun enough. And yeah, the 90 minute playtime is a thing because it, it can take longer with slow players. But for the mm-hmm. most part, this is a quicker Euro. And it's kind of like when everything comes out, that's got to be two and a half to three hours long. It's like it's just nice to have a Euro that's simple enough to get done yeah. in 90 minutes. But I do like how you've got the fame and the money track. And yes, when they the meet is when you win. So it's like, have I gone for heavy money? If I gone for heavy fame, typically you tend to meet in the middle or go heavy money. But and but I do get the flaw, and this is one problem I do have with it. That yes, it does feel a little samey. Yeah, this is one I'm very yeah. much looking forward to an expansion for. I know they have like a a goodies pack, which I I think I actually just recently got it. I just haven't gotten it to the table yet since I've gotten the goodies pack. I don't know if that mixes things up in any mm-hmm. relevant enough way. But uh, I'm intrigued to see what happens with one. If it's like Queen Games, I'm not sure. I mean, the the goodies bags yeah. that they did, they don't change up enough. It's just like a little mini expansion. And yeah. I mean, they jumped the shark doing Raj- Rogers the dice game. It's like it's already pretty yeah. much a dice uh, game. Why do I need a dice roll and write for this? It's like it's this okay. is the they wrong have thing. Terraforming Mars the card game is coming soon to Kickstarter. Apparently, you're like. <laughs> well, to be fair, I would give that a better pass than the normal because part of me is kind of like, well, this is Terraforming Mars. It's like a three hour game that's pretty lucky oh. with a big border down. And it's kind of like, well, hang on, if you can give me that card feeling, but in a shorter play time without the board. Maybe I'll actually like this one. I'll you know? play it. I'll get my hands in it. I just think it's amusing to call it Terraforming Mars the card game. But yeah. That is, well, you think a worse thing. The, <laughs> I bought a few games because I need more stuff to try and review because there's nothing coming out. But uh, I bought one game that I was interested in because I know I don't like Lorenzo and Magnifico, as I said last episode. Yeah. Um, but the Masters of Renaissance one is supposedly a condensed version down of it. So okay. that game, but smaller. And it's kind of like, they're not too similar though but it's kind of like all right maybe i'll enjoy this one more so i thought fine i'll i think asmodeo sending me a copy so i'll do a full review on it but the weird thing is it's called lorenzo de magnifico the card game yeah but 
not only has it got some fair differences to Lorenzo and Magnifico, to call it the card game is a bit weird because, yes, it has cards in it, but then it's also got little marbles, a few little board tiles and stuff like that. And it's like, no, this is not the card game. <laughs> it's, like, it's smaller. It's not even a, it's not a roll and write idea. It's a completely it's literally just got the same art style and setting as Lorenzo. Mm. But apart from that, you might as well just call it Masters of Renaissance. It, I don't see why it had to have Lorenzo the card game in it, apart from just sell copies. <laughs> cool. Well, Luke, that brings us to 30 games. You had a better track record of the ones you hit than I did. Um, but overall, we agreed <laughs> a lot more on this list. I don't know mm. if we had any significant disagreements. Uh, not that we had that many in the last, but we, had, we certainly had a few. But uh, for those who did not yet watch the original video, like I said at the beginning, I will include a link down below to Luke's channel and to that video. Go ahead and give that a <laughs> check out if you want to see us actually disagree on a few games as opposed to this one, which was far <laughs> more boring. But past that, Luke, it's been a pleasure. Again, this was fun to and do. Always. <laughs> um, again, ran to an hour and a half, which I thought we'd be able to keep it shorter, but so much for that. You um, can't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the truth is, an hour and a half for 30 games is three minutes per game, which is not bad when considering discussion back and forth. So yeah. all, all things considered, I'll just be <laughs> happy it didn't go longer. But yeah, that's basically it. So for everyone else, again, links down below. Thanks for joining us. Luke, thanks so much. And for everyone else, have a good one. Have a good time, Ava. Take care.